age 65, Jim Rockstad is retired, although he stays plenty busy playing his favorite sport, racquetball, three days a week, year round. Ali Chard is a freshman at the University of Washington who enjoys biking, soccer, skiing, and running. John Tips is a 49-year-old construction manager who enjoys rock climbing, bicycling, and Bikram yoga. Besides an active lifestyle, these three have something else in common. Each sustained a shoulder injury that required surgery to repair it. The shoulder is the most unstable joint in the body and therefore is very dependent on the soft tissue supports, which include the ligaments and the tendons and the cartilage and the muscles. So maintaining the shoulder in a stable situation that allows people to be very active with their shoulders is a very challenging endeavor. Jim, Allie, and John all sought treatment at the University of Washington Medical Center's Bone and Joint Surgery Center. For anyone who might have a shoulder injury, it's important to know when to seek medical help. Well, a patient with a shoulder problem should see a doctor whenever it really interferes with the quality of their life. It's a pretty simple test. So if they can't sleep, if they can't do their job, if they can't do their recreation, if they're not enjoying life because of a shoulder problem, they need to see somebody about it because there are a lot of different diagnoses that can interrupt shoulder comfort and function, rotator cuff tears, arthritis, infections, tumors, all sorts of other things. So it's really important that significant shoulder problems get investigated and defined so the patient knows what they're dealing with. Two years ago, Jim Rockstad was living with some painful limitations. I, I had a lot of arthritis in the shoulder, the range of motion. I couldn't even use a razor on my face because I just couldn't pick my, my arm up at all. I couldn't sleep on my shoulder. There was just no way. It was just too painful. Couldn't throw a baseball. I'd kind of throw it sidearm when I would do it. As I had, the range of motion was just terrible. I thought it was racquetball that was causing. For Jim, the like many other individuals, shoulder arthritis took much of the enjoyment out of life. On shoulders. So when when a person has arthritis of the shoulder, it's both the ball side and the socket side that are damaged. Normally in your shoulder, the ball is covered with cartilage and the socket is covered with cartilage, so the two move together very smoothly. In fact, the friction is less than the friction of an ice skate on ice. It's really a, a biological marvel that nature can accomplish this. In shoulder arthritis, the cartilage covering the bones of the shoulder joint is progressively destroyed so that bare bone rubs on bare bone. This causes catching, popping, stiffness, and pain. After enduring months of pain, Jim listened to a friend's advice and made an appointment with Dr. Rick Matson. So, uh, I gave Dr. Matson a call and I went over and saw him and then he took x-rays, told me exactly what the problem was and, and, and that really the two approaches we could do it, one with the, with the uh, plastic pad for the socket in the shoulder or the other one was to ream it out where the cartilage would grow back and it sounded kind of weird to me, but I, I, I said that I was more than willing to, to, to do that and I, that made more sense to me because then I could get a lot of range of motion and uh, get back to playing racquetball. The metal on plastic total shoulder technique is a proven approach to the treatment of shoulder arthritis, especially for individuals who do not plan on high levels of shoulder use. So one approach to that is to put a metal ball on the arm bone side and a plastic socket on the shoulder blade side and have those two surfaces work together. Now that is a very good solution and we still use that a lot today. But the liability with that approach is heavy use is likely to make the plastic socket loosen or wear. One of the challenges in doing this operation is you often not doing it on frail little people but on great big guys. You have to be prepared to sort of wade in there. Jim wished to continue playing racquetball after surgery, and because the sport is very demanding on the shoulder, he and Dr. Matson decided on the ream and run procedure, an alternative to a conventional total shoulder replacement. 
This is a procedure that Dr. Matson offers to young and very active individuals, allowing them to remain involved in high-level fitness, recreational, and vocational pursuits without the risk of glenoid component failure. So the alternative is to still use the metal ball on the arm bone side, but to use a biological approach to the socket side. What I mean by a biological approach is that we actually grind the socket to exactly the right shape and smoothness and let, let the body heal that over again as the ball works on it during the rehabilitation period. So what we're doing is using the reaming of the socket to form the perfect shape but then let nature resurface it with a biological surface that doesn't wear and doesn't loosen and that will remodel according to the way they use their arm. Dr. Matson pioneered the Riemann Run procedure at the University of Washington Medical Center in 1990. His research is focused on how to stimulate the regeneration of the body's own tissues. He discovered that reaming the glenoid socket allowed cartilage to rebuild itself in that area recreating a smooth joint surface. One of the great things as far as the University of Washington Medical Center, as far as I'm personally concerned, is it's given me the opportunity to develop as a surgeon and as a physician. So I've had the opportunity to give patients over 7,000 joint replacements for their shoulder. That's a tremendous experience that I've been able to garner and now offer to the patients that we are seeing today. The patient's shoulder begins to heal as soon as surgery is complete. Within minutes, the body starts to send growth factors and stem cells into the area. Dr. Matson uses a continuous passive motion machine, or CPM, immediately after surgery to guide the healing of the reamed bone surface. Today we're showing you what the CPM machine is, that's the continuous passive motion machine. And what it allows for is to move the patient's arm and shoulder following a shoulder surgery to allow it to move, to help with healing, to help with um, motion, and to help with the uh, post-operative recovery. And what it does is it allows the arm to move in external rotation as well as forward elevation up to approximately 90 degrees and allows it to move back down continually over an hour span or as long as you'd like it to. Optimal healing of Riemann Run requires that the patient maintain the motion of the shoulder to assure that a smooth joint surface develops. It's really important for the first six to 12 weeks after the surgery that the person dedicate themselves to getting their range of motion because it's, it's the range of motion of the, of the shoulder during that early recovery period that stimulates the formation of the new joint surface. Today, results for the Riemann Run procedure approach those of a traditional shoulder replacement using a plastic glenoid implant. An advantage of Riemann Run is that it avoids the risks of wear and loosening of the glenoid implant. Again, however, this procedure requires a committed effort on the patient's part. The joint surface needs motion to regenerate. So that's quite different than what's necessary in a total shoulder replacement with a plastic socket where the joint surface is prefabricated and implanted. So um, Jim was a, a superstar in getting his rehab done, dedicating himself to it, and people like him will make this operation successful. For Jim Rockstad, the ream and run procedure has produced results beyond his expectations. Without question, the ream and run approach to, to doing this, this shoulder like this is just a, a wonderful thing, and I, I'm obviously proof of that. Uh, it takes a lot of work for, for the uh, patient over a period of time and uh, as long as they do the physical therapy and they could add into it some weights and some strengthening like I've done, which is only good for your health anyway, and uh, you'll be so much better off. I, I myself, I could never hit the ball as hard as I do. Even in early in my life, I could not do that as hard as I'm doing now. His friends are so amazed that they even came up with a new nickname for him. They now call him the Bionic Man. There, there's guys that I play racquetball with that are just in awe over me when they see me at 65 years old, swinging a racket that hard, hitting the ball at you know 100 plus miles an hour. It's just amazing. While shoulder pain is often due to arthritis, that's not the only cause. John Tipp's shoulder problems were the result of a traumatic injury to a tendon. 
I had a rotator cuff injury, I guess. Uh, I, um, I always ask people if they want the long story or the short story. The short story is I, I, I took a fall down some stairs. Uh, my, the long story is my daughter and I were making pizza one day and we had music cranked up and we were having a lot of fun making pizza and we had some semolina flour got on the floor and we were sliding around in our socks having fun and I needed to get something in the basement and I dashed down the basement stairs and my feet went out at the top of the stairs and I flew down the whole flight and came down a, on a locked out elbow and dislocated my shoulder briefly and uh, that wasn't good, it, it hurt quite a bit. Rotator cuff tears are very common in the general population. You don't have to be a competitive athlete to sustain a rotator cuff tear. One of the reasons that the rotator cuff tears is as we age, our tendons Exhale, become down. weaker. One, two, and five, so three, it takes less four, force or less trauma to tear a rotator cuff tendon as we age. That's one of the reasons that these tears are more common in patients uh, over 35 years of age. So you don't have to be a major league pitcher to get a rotator cuff tear. The injury became a real problem for John's active lifestyle, which includes rock climbing, skiing, and Bikram yoga. He tried physical therapy, but the pain never went away. That's very common that patients will uh, put this off and anticipate their body to heal because they've healed up after a variety of other injuries over the years. And so they apply a tincture of time, as it were. And oftentimes, however, if the rotator cuff is torn significantly, and there's a lot of pain and dysfunction in the shoulder and the muscles that stabilize the scapula or shoulder blade, uh, the pain will keep coming back and eventually patients will come to see us. And that's what John did. His family practice physician referred him to the University of Washington Medical Center's shoulder and elbow service at the Bone and Joint Surgery Center. Uh, when I first met Dr. Warm, I immediately liked him because he seemed to really grasp that I was a very active guy. The rotator cuff is a group of four tendons that blend together to help stabilize and move the shoulder. Each of the four tendons connects a muscle originating on the shoulder blade, also known as the scapula, to a section of the upper part of the arm bone called the humerus. Rotator cuff tears range from small to massive in size. Tears resulting from major injury can usually be repaired successfully if surgery is not delayed more than several months, ideally within a few weeks. And the fact that I had waited a little bit meant that I might, might have lowered my chances for complete healing, but that he thought the chances were still very good and really explained how it worked and the reattachment process and that right that sort of thing. Uh, right off the bat, and I felt confident all along that I, I really wanted to pursue the surgery. All that tissue should be hooking right up to the bone there, and it's way off medially, so that's a bit of a problem for him. Rotator cuff surgery is a highly technical procedure. It begins with small half-inch incisions that allow the bursitis and scar tissue to be removed from the space beneath the deltoid and the acromion. The torn tendon is mobilized and finally reattached to the location on the arm bone from which it was torn. The success of the surgery is often defined by the patient's expectations and their commitment to the rehabilitation. Every patient is an individual, and so I enjoy getting to know patients and find out what their desires and aspirations are, what kind of sports they like to do, or what they do for fun and adventure, and therefore I'll change their treatment perhaps in order to help them accomplish those goals. One of the activities I was telling you about that I had been missing was rock climbing, and, and Dr. Worms actually is, I guess, a rock climber himself. So uh, it was refreshing for me that he immediately understood that, you know, I'm 49 years old now, I guess at that time I was 48, and 
uh, just didn't want to give it up, give up the hope that I could live my life the way I wanted to and keep all my activities. Dr. Warm performed John's arthroscopic rotator cuff surgery in October, eight months after his initial injury. The next critical step to a full recovery will be determined by how committed John is to the rehabilitation process. What Dr. Warm really emphasized on the recovery process was that I would not be able to raise my arm for the first six weeks after the surgery. It was critical that the arm stayed down and didn't raise on its own, uh, under its own power for a good six weeks uh, after that. Um, and uh, actually uh, couldn't raise under its own power for 12 weeks after the surgery. After six weeks, I started doing a lot of passive raising with uh, pulleys and with some exercises. I, I raised it with the other arm. Um, but he really emphasized that I shouldn't go through the surgery procedure without a real firm commitment to not raising the arm for the first three months. Physical therapists are our chief advocates and allies in helping patients get back to full speed. How they help us is that they are monitoring the patients very closely and seeing them several times a week. And they're talking with the patients, finding out how they're feeling, how they're doing with their exercises. They're coaching them and how to perform the exercises properly. And they're also helping the patient to slow down enough to allow their body to heal. So they'll push them in ways that it's safe to push them, but they'll also prevent them from causing further harm by pushing themselves faster than their body can heal. The recovery process can take some time, but John's commitment to physical therapy and his home exercise program is paying off. I feel like I was ahead of the curve on recovery because of all the yoga I did before going into the surgery, actually. Throughout my entire life, I've been pretty active and fairly athletic. Uh, and I didn't think that yoga could keep me in really top-notch shape, but I got involved with Bikram yoga, and uh, that yoga is a little more regimented. They move you through the poses, one right after the other. They heat the studio to 105 degrees and increase the humidity, which really increases your flexibility. Back, way back, go back, more back. John credits the Bikram yoga with increasing his strength, flexibility, and stamina, which has really helped his healing process. I, I think my expectations for the for the surgery for the healing have been exceeded. Uh, I, I really feel um, practically 100 percent back. I, I think the little bit of, of strength I still need to gain will still come. Uh, I'm not quite back 100 percent, but I think it's coming. Straighten the arms, elbows locked. A bicycle accident was the beginning of Ali Chard's shoulder problems. I was on a family biking trip and we were coming out from the cabin. There was a big hill. My little brothers um, went down the gravel hill fine. We had all of this um, sleeping bags, the camping gear on our bikes, and so they were heavier in the back. And my brothers just tore down it, and so I thought I could do that too. Went down it, put the brakes on, and just flew off the bike um, and ended up dislocating my shoulder. Like many young active people, Allie would dislocate her shoulder once again. I was playing soccer with um, the Navy RTC. We were playing against the international students. Um, a whole bunch of boys, two girls, and me and another guy went at the ball, and he was a little bit bigger than me, so I flew instead of him. And um, as soon as I landed, I knew I had dislocated my shoulder again. It's very common in young active patients to sustain a dislocation of a shoulder. It's the most commonly dislocated joint. And some patients will develop recurrent instability where their joint after an injury becomes unstable and it will pop completely out on occasion or it will just move excessively to the point where they can't function. Allie's injury was a Bankart lesion. When her shoulder popped out of joint, it tore the labrum, a cuff of cartilage at the front of the socket. 
Dr. Warm performed a bank art repair arthroscopically using three small incisions, each less than a centimeter in length. One of the advantages to arthroscopic surgery is we can operate on both the front and the back and sometimes even the top of the shoulder joint in order to fix all the torn tissues. As I mentioned, we make these incisions and there are usually two in the front, one in the back. We put small plastic tubes, they are called cannulas, through these incisions which allow us to go in and out of the shoulder with different instruments and placing the arthroscope or camera in the various cannulas to look at the shoulder from various directions and it really enables us to see the entire shoulder and uh, treat all the pathology or problems that we find. The bank art repair reattaches the cartilage and ligaments to the socket of the shoulder joint, which restores stability to the shoulder and prevents additional dislocations. What we find when we do the procedure is that the cartilage and the attached ligaments are not in the correct position. They have often scarred down in a in a position that allows the shoulder to remain unstable. So the first thing we do is we mobilize those ligaments, in other words, loosen them up from their scarred down position and move them into correct position. And then we'll hold them in that correct position utilizing little devices called suture anchors. And what these devices are are small, uh, bioabsorbable or dissolvable anchors that hold strong sutures to the bone and allow us to really uh, tightly repair the torn tissues in their anatomic or correct position. He's got some fraying here and some synovitis which we can clean up. And this looks pretty loose. He had no posterior instability issues though, so we have to think hard before we poke this and we can look at it from the front. Look bad. For Allie, the toughest part of recovery was inactivity. Following surgery, she had to rest her shoulder for a while. She wore a sling to prevent her from using her arm and she couldn't run, bike outdoors, or engage in any of her usual workouts. The biggest problem with our young and active patients is that they feel so much better that their shoulder is behaving that they don't give it adequate time to heal. And they have a tendency to want to get out of their slings too quickly. And a lot of my job, as well as our therapists, and colleagues job is to remind them to slow down and give their bodies a chance to heal. A month after surgery, Dr. Warm allowed Allie to start gradually increasing her activity. Physical therapy followed. She can't play contact sports just yet, but as her shoulder continues to heal, she's been able to return to working out. And that's what it's all about, getting people back to their active lifestyles. I feel so good. Um, my favorite activity is to run, and it was difficult not being able to do that for about three months, I'd say, but um, I feel really good. I don't feel like I lost anything um, since Dr. Worm allowed me to exercise aside from using my arms, and I'm ready for a summer of activity. <laughs> for more information, to make an appointment, or to refer a patient, Contact the University of Washington Medical Center's Bone and Joint Surgery Center. Phone number 206-598-4288 or go to www.orthop.washington.edu slash shoulder elbow.